guys. Uh, I'm sorry, A, to have kept you waiting, and B, then, to turn, have turned my back on you. Uh, but I just came in and thought, gracious, it's quite warm in here, and I wonder if there's anything that can be done about it. That was all. I'm, I'm grateful it was rather warm in here this morning. <laughs> anything that can be done with B will be very helpful. Thank you. Well, lady, I was just beginning to develop our ground one, the fourth of my seven headings. Yes. And our broad proposition that read in context, Article 6.2, the fifth limb, is designed to deal with payments of income to the grantor of the working or the right to work, i.e. payments of that particular character being payments for use of the immovable property. And 6.2, the fifth limb, does not extend to payments for the transfer or alienation of uh, the right to work. Now, we say that <coughs> by reference to six features of the landscape. First, going back to 6.1, that applies to income from immovable property. Immovable property is then defined by reference to 6.2, and in particular the second sentence of 6.2 extends what might otherwise be the notion of immovable property, but the income still ultimately has to be from immovable property. 6.3 makes clear that there can be income from immovable property by different forms of use. direct use, letting, or use in any other form. But it's from the use of the movable property. And that's clearly designed to deal with circumstances in which a person holds a movable property and derives income by turning it to account through the use by that person or the use by another. Second factor, related to the first, is that 6.3 makes provision for profits derived from the alienation of immovable property. But 6.3 read with Article 13 is clearly designed to ensure that what is covered by 6.3 is the dealer in immovable property who makes a revenue of it in contrast to the seller of a capital asset who is to be taxed in accordance with the provisions of Article 13. Would you say that again? A read with Article 13, it makes a distinction between the dealer who makes a revenue profit, profit yes, and the person who sells a capital <coughs> asset which the treaty intends to deal with under Article 13. Is that a simple distinction between profit equals income and gains equals capital? Correct. Is, is that a recognised usage in the world? In the world of tax, it is. Yes. <clears throat> and in the world of double tax treaties? I mean, it, is there anything in the treaty that defines those terms in expressly? Then I quite accept my lord that there is. But, but you say it's a well recognised and understood capital revenue distinction. Un uncontrovertible in the world of international tax. But significantly, provision is made for alienation in 6.3. Provision is not made for alienation on the face of 6.2. 
6.2 does not say write the payment as consideration for or from the alienation of the working or the right to work minimum. Parties have agreed that a particular type of alienation will be dealt with in six. But that is dealt with in six three and not in six two. Equally, six two does not say rights to payments as consideration for the working of or the right to work mineral deposits or payments computed by reference to mineral deposits or mineral production. Here it's useful in our submission just to turn up tab 7 in the first volume of authorities which is the double tax agreement between Canada and the United States entered into in 1980 with a protocol in 1983 you see that at the first hole pump article 6 of that agreement is on page 136 of the bundle article 6.2 in the treaty as rewritten defines real property so the first sentence of 6.2 is very similar to our 6.2 second sentence the term shall in any case include very similar to our 6.2 and it doesn't have all of the limbs of our 6.2 but it does include rights to explore for or to exploit mineral deposits, sources and other natural resources and rights to amounts computed by reference to the amount or value of production from such resources. So that's an example of a treaty entered into by Canada, of which there are several, where there is an extension of 6.2 to a right to amounts computed by reference to oil production. Are you saying that Canada is party to a number of such treaties? Yes, there are four. So it's not just a US no. provision? Canada has a treaty with Brazil, 1984, Papua New Guinea, 1987, and Denmark, 1997, each of which has that language in. So we can provide the court with the pages that show that if it would be helpful. Is it <coughs> in accordance with the Provisions you showed us before lunch are an admissible tool to construe a UK Canada treaty signed in 1978. Canada subsequently, from 1980 onwards, used different language in different treaties with different parties. Canada has used the language we see in the UK agreement in other treaties. Canada has used different language in different treaties with other counterparties. I cannot say to this court that you must construe our particular treaty by reference to this language. The purpose of showing you this, which I say is an admissible source, is for you to see the choices that our contracting states could have made but did not on the face of 60. Yes. Thank you. There is one other feature of the Canadian position that is also Material, is if you turn up tab 9 of the first volume, Canada adopted in 1985 a domestic statute called the Income Tax Conventions Interpretation Act, which you have behind tab 9, done in both English and French. And that was designed to apply certain <coughs> rules domestically irrespective of the treaty that Canada had entered into. So if one turns to page 181 of the bundle, clause 5 of this Act provides definitions 
notwithstanding the provisions of the Convention or the Act giving the Convention the force of law in Canada, in this section and in the Convention, and then three items down, immovable property and real property, with respect to property in Canada, are hereby declared to include, little a, the right to explore for or exploit mineral deposits and sources in Canada, and b, any right to an amount computed by reference for the production of mineral deposits. So this was a species of Canadian domestic treaty over the effect that whatever provisions Canada had agreed, the Convention should be read in Canada as extending the notion of immovable property to little b, an amount computed by reference for the production of minerals. Now, the UK has not adopted an equivalent rule. So that means that if we were in the mirror image situation, London Bank had advanced money to an English company with a Canadian subsidiary exploiting Canadian mineral resources. On your argument, the Canadians would tax it on the disc because it would be a right to an amount computed to you by reference to them, but the English HMRC would still be entitled to tax it as profit from an English company. Yeah. And if, if, if I am appearing in Ottawa and this court is the Supreme Court of Canada, that is exactly the dynamic, because the Canadians have adopted a domestic rule overriding whatever else they've agreed. Is that not a breach of the treaty? <laughs> um, <laughs> there is an interesting debate to be had in the Supreme Court of Canada as to whether the Canadians are permitted to override Sovereign Act. And in the UK, I think the theory would be that Parliament is always sovereign. So if by a later act, Parliament decides to override a treaty. But Parliament's entitled to break treaties, as far as we're concerned, as far as domestic courts are concerned. We give primacy to decisions of Parliament yes. over international treaties. Yes. And the UK has, on a rare occasion, has overridden our treaty obligations. There would be an equivalent debate in Canada which, whether they're entitled to do it. But for practical purpose, they've done it. And so the Canadians, where the resources are in Canada, so if you're talking about gold in Alberta or British Columbia, this provision would apply irrespective of the treaty. The UK has not adopted that rule, um, either out of sensitivity about its treaty obligations or because the UK thinks it's adequately protected by the deemed permanent establishment rule in Article 27A. But be that as it may, I, I can't answer as to why. What is interesting is that there is a payment computed by reference rule in treaties that Canada has signed with other jurisdictions and in Canadian domestic law but it doesn't appear in our treaty. Thank you. Now, th there is one point just thinking about the scope, of, coming back to the scope of Article 6.3. Um, there is a point made in the commentary, the OECD commentary on Article 6, which otherwise doesn't address the problem before the court. Because if, if it were there, in a sense, we wouldn't have got to the Court of Appeal, but it's just not there. But there is a reference in the commentary to income indirectly arrived from immovable property. And just for your note, it's in the 2005 commentary. It's in um, the third volume of authorities at tab 29, page 767. And I'll deal with this in more detail in reply if need be. But the answer to that point that's been made below is that that reference to indirectly deriving income from uh, immovable property designed to deal with circumstances in which a business derives income from removable property. And the commentary is making clear that the fact that what is otherwise rent, income from removable property, if it's received by a business, it doesn't lose its character as rent. It's not saying anything more than that. So the 
third um, feature of the landscape that we say drives one in the conclusion towards the conclusion that this is limited to um, payments to the grant or for the use of the, the working or the right to work is the scope of Article 13 and the need to read the treaty as a coherent whole. So, uh, we've covered this ground, but Article 6 defines immovable property for the whole convention, including Article 13. 13 1 deals with alienation of immovable property as defined in Article 6. 13 4 deals with the alienation of the right to drill for oil or the right to the oil one, but neither of those are immovable property as defined for the convention. And then 13.5 deals with the sale of certain shares where the company holds either immovable property or 13.4 rights, but the 13.4 rights are not themselves immovable property. And that is the point that's made in the explanatory note to the 1980 order that I invited you to sideline when we briefly looked at it, is that the 13 four rights are not themselves immovables, but they are movables. Sorry, that was the explanatory note to the yeah. SI, To the it? SI, yes. Which I accept is headed, this is not part of the order. But it is entirely consistent with our reading of the 13. So reading 6 and 13 together, it's quite clear that the right to explore and take the oil and the right to the oil one are movable. And that the alienation of such rights are dealt with in Article 13 and not Article 6. And once one can see that the alienation of the oil rights and the right to the oil one are dealt with in 13, one can see why Article 6.2 is limited to income derived as the grantor of such rights and not as the transfer or of such rights. And that was a point we put to the first tier, recorded in paragraph 38 of the first tier decision, but it's not addressed in the first tier at all. The relevant paragraphs are 54 and 55, and they just don't address it. It was a point we put to the upper tier, upper tribunal, paragraph 69, but rejected at paragraph 139. Here it's also useful just to see one other feature of the wider landscape. One turns up um, tab 11 of the first volume of authorities. There is the treaty between the UK and the US. This is the 2001 treaty. And that has a definition of real property on page 198, which is Article 31M. And that definition of real property is relevantly the same as our Article 6.2 fifth limb. So the penultimate three lines in M, rights to variable or fixed payments of consideration for the working or the right to work mineral deposits, etc. Article 6, page 202, deals with income from real property, very short. that's using the 3.1.M definition. And then Article 13, page 210, <coughs> deals with gains made from the alienation of real property, 13.1. And then 13.2 says, for the purposes of this article. So the UK's agreement with the US has a separate definition of immovable property for the purposes of Article so real property situated in the other contracting state shall include A, rights to assets to be produced by the exploration or exploitation of the seabed, including rights to interest in or the benefit of such assets. So that's saying for 13 purposes in that treaty, 
the rights to the oil are immovable property. Now, that, of course, is a different agreement between two different parties, the UK only being one of them, and it is a later agreement. But it does show that the parties had to make specific provision in that case to extend the notion of real property for the purposes of Article 13, which we do not have in our, in our agreement. And there's a technical explanation produced by the US Treasury that, that provides a useful commentary on all of this. Uh, and it's in the third volume of authorities, tab 28, the relevant passage being at page 614. So my third feature is that one has to uh, arrive at a coherent reading of 6 and 13 together. Fourth feature is the comparison between the language of 6.2 and Article 12. Just going back to tab 4, Article 6.2 of this treaty, the relevant language is consideration for the working of or the right to work. That, we say, is materially <coughs> the same as the language of Article 12, 12 for consideration for the use or the right to use intellectual property. It is clear on the face of Article 12 that that language is designed to deal with a royalty that, it is, that is qualitative payment for the use of the particular asset. We say by comparison, the language of 6.2 is to the like effect. It's a right to payment as consideration for the use of the working or the right to work. And although there is no commentary directly on point on Article 6, there is OECD commentary that is directly on point on Article 12. And here one needs the third volume of authorities. The 2005 commentary is at tab 29. The model convention itself begins at 759, and we've extracted the relevant um, articles. So Article <coughs> 6 is at page 767, and Articles 12 and 13 are at page 772. The commentary on Article 6 is at page 786. And then the commentary on Article 12 is at page 808. And in particular, it's paragraph 8 of the commentary at page 810, which refers to the definition of the term royalties. So paragraph 2 contains the definition of the term royalties. These relate in general to rights or property constituting the different forms of literary and artistic property, etc. The definition applies to payments for the use of or the entitlement to use rights of the kind mentioned, whether or not they have been or are required to be registered in a public register. The definition covers both payments made under a license and compensation which a person will be obliged to pay for fraudulently copying or infringing the right. The definition does not, however, apply to payments that whilst based on the number of times a right belonging to someone is used, are made to someone else who does not himself own the rights uh, the right or the right to use it. And then 8.1 makes clear that that reference to the right to use the type of property is a reference to a payment made to the person by whom the right is granted. Now, as 
Latin terms is commentary saying that where you have the consideration for the use or the right to use, they are qualitatively payments made by someone who has that right to the grantor of that right. And by parity of reasoning, we say when you look at 6.2, it is also a payment made as consideration for the use of the right to work to the person by whom that right has been granted. Not necessarily the original grantor. It could be a, someone who's acquired the land since. But the, the quality is that you're making payments to someone who would otherwise have the right themselves. To come back to your lady's um, the rent analogy, yes, you might be a, a head lessee, sub lessor, but the quality of what you receive is payment for the grant of the right. If you are the assignee <coughs> of the landlord, that which you receive is still payment for the use of the asset that is being. It's not payment for the assignment. Not payment for the assignment. By reason of the use of the property. Yes. And that, we say, is the proper divide between 6 and 13. And 12 demonstrates why, why that is right. Just for your note, um, in case it occurs to you afterwards, this is in the 2005 commentary. Of course, the 2005 commentary long postdates our treaty. There is an equivalent passage to like effect in the 1977 commentary, which is the first commentary, either the first or the second commentary on the OECD model. So what you're seeing in the 2005 one is a convenient expression of a point that's long been made in relation to Article 12. Can we just go back to how you described this again? Um, it, it's the payment for the use, but but to someone who has who actually has an interest in land such that they would otherwise have that right themselves. Is that yes. is that the key point? Yes, it's it's someone who. Well, it's easy to express just in pure landlord terms, but if you own the land and you work the land yourself. Income, unless you're carrying on a business. But if you own the land and you let somebody else use the land in return for rent, you've also got six one income. But it's the character or the, the quality or the nature of the income that is derived from the rights that you can confer on your counterparty, being the right to use that which otherwise would be your asset. And that is occasioned by the grant, or the lease, or the license, or even a sublease or a sublicense. It's not a payment made for the transfer or assignment or alienation, because unless you're a dealer, caught by 6.3, that's covered by Article 13. That answer my, my lady. Yes, I mean, I, one way of conceptualizing this is by reference to the recipient of the incomes having a continuing interest in the land. I'm not sure that's the way you're framing it, though. Uh, I'm not sure that's the that way you would be frame it. true of a land interest. And it's perhaps most easily understood because if I'm the freeholder and I grant a lease. Yes, but it, but essentially we are dealing with land or things related to land here, so it's not a it's not well, it's, it's very close. The wrong in, it's a very close analogy to where we are. But I, as the freeholder, even if I granted a thousand year lease, so my reversion is as thin as thin could be, I still retain the asset, albeit I have granted the use for all practical purposes for, for almost all time. 
time to somebody else. Whereas in the alienation situation, you just, you have no interest. Correct. 13 clearly deals with alienation. 6.3 deals with me if I alienate and I'm a dealer. 6.1 and 6.2 are where I don't alienate. My fifth point is consideration of the French text. We say, properly understood, that makes clear that the phrase in English, consideration for, is designed to address the position of the grantor and not the assignor or the transfer. And there's a danger of high comedy here where I reveal the inadequacies of my French A level. Um, but if the court will just bear with me for a few moments. Um, we know the French text is equally authoritative. Our case is that it's part of English law, and the upper tribunal were wrong to conclude otherwise. That's <coughs> skeleton, paragraph 51. But in any event, it appears to be common ground that this court can and should consider the French text to seek to understand the meaning of the English text. And of course, <laughs> in the case, there is one treaty done in two languages. The French text is behind tab 5 of the first bundle of authorities. It's at page 67. We're concerned with 6.2, which defines bien humilié. That's the first line of 6.2. Um, and then the second sentence begins, expression en gros en tout cas. And then you'll see the point I made, le cheptel mort ou vivre. That's livestock, dead or alive. <laughs> the oddity, the oddity so, okay. of the, the apparent difference between the two. What does cheptel mean? Uh, livestock. So we've got in English livestock, and in French we've got livestock, dead or alive. It doesn't mean livestock or dead stock. <laughs> in French it, it may well mean livestock or dead stock. But on the face of the French version, it just uses the term that we would conventionally translate as livestock, but then saying dead or alive. <coughs> so a wrinkle, but we don't need to resolve that one. <laughs> no. um, but two lines down, you can see after the reference to use of we, um, and then it's les trois à des redevances, so the rights to, and then redevances is payments, and then you have variable ou fixe, um, and then pour l'exploitation, that's the working, ou la concession de l'exploitation, so that's the right to work, and then the reference to gisement mineral source et autre richesse du sol, so that's the reference to uh, the mineral resources themselves. The French text does not have the equivalent of the English term consideration. It just uses pour. So it's variable ou fixe pour. That's pour. But it does use la concession, l'exploitation. And it also uses droit. When we talk about a right to payments, it's les droits et les redevances. But when we're talking about the right to work, the term used is la concession. And we say, properly understood, that that is a reference to the grant of the right and not to the transfer of the right. Turning that point around, if my learned friends were right, the reference to payment from a right to however acquired, would there have referred to a droit and not la concession. Now, to buttress this point below, we showed the upper tribunal and the first tribunal the 
Canadian Revenue Agency Act, an act dealing with the Canadian revenues, creation and powers, that uses concede to mean grant. If you just turn this up, it's tab 10 of the authorities bundle, where you find the Revenue Agency Act, all acts in Canada are done in both English and in French, page 190, section 78, this is agency real property may be granted and agency immovables may be conceded. And then it tells you how that can be done by the Canadian Revenue Agency. And if one runs an eye down the left-hand column, the English, it talks in terms of grant and conceding or grant and concession. And it also draws a distinction between grant, conceding and transferring. And if one looks at, to the right-hand column, the French, that talks in terms of concede and an acte de concession, which is B. And then capital C draws a distinction between an acte de concession, d'affectation, et de transfert. So again, drawing a distinction between concession, conceding, granting, and transfer. Yeah. In light of that point, the commissioners make a point in their guys an argument that um, in the English version of this particular uh, statute there's a reference to both grant and conceded and the reason for that is not only is Canada bilingual but it's also bidural i.e. there is a harmonized system across the whole of Canadian federal law to the effect that federal law should be harmonized between the common law and the civil law of Quebec. And that process is explained in the uh, statute that's at tab 12, which is the statute that is designed to harmonize these two systems. And in particular, it identifies that where you talk in the common law sense of granting, one talks in the civil law sense of conceding. They are designed to mean the same thing. Where is that in tab 12? Um, it's tab 12 is the act itself. Mm -hmm. And the relevant, the explanation of the act is at page 254. So it tells you this is designed to harmonize. And then 255 onwards are a series of acts that are amended so that they are brought into harmony. And then 260 is um, the relevant harmonization of the concepts of grant and concession. Uh, and Canada has adopted an approach that where the act is expressed in English, we use the common law term first, grant before concession and where the act is expressed in French they use the civil law concept first they would talk of an act of concession uh, and in particular um, the detail I, I suspect doesn't matter but the Section 78 of the Canadian Revenue Agency Act is harmonized on page 264. But the only point of showing you this is that there's nothing unusual about there being both a reference to grant and concession in the English version of a given statute. But what is significant here is that when we look at our back at our treaty, our treaty in the French language version only talks in terms of la concession. And we say that means grant. It doesn't mean a right. It means a concession, not a right. It's not droit. And it doesn't talk in terms of transferring or alienating, however that might be expressed in French. Now, we also relied uh, below um, on some Canadian legal dictionaries um, and there in the third volume of tabs 30 and 31. Um, I don't invite you to turn them up uh, now. 
they do make clear that when you see the uh, expression la concession, if you're a French Canadian lawyer, you are looking at the notion of a grant. So returning to 6 2 in the French, we say concession means grant, and it is explicit that the exploitation has to be as a result of la concession. So again, reading the French, it is clear that the payment is made to the grantor is qualitatively a payment to the grantor for the use of an asset. Six, the last indicator is a point I've made before, but let me just give it to you for your note. Um, it is clear on the face of the English language version, and indeed the French, that the right in question to be immovable property has to be consideration for the right to work or the working. In our cases, you can't work without the right to work, and that formulation is designed to deal with two different types of commercial deal, one where you might pay for the right by time, and the other where you might pay for the working by unit. So there's no other significance in, in that um, than that. So drawing those threads together, <coughs> giving effect to the French language reference to la concession, giving effect to the similarity of the language with Article 12 and the benefit of the OECD commentary, ensuring coherence between Article 6 and Article 13, respecting the fact that 6.3 talks about alienation, but there's no mention of that in 6.2, respecting the fact that the contracting states could have provided in Article 6.2 to extend the notion by reference to a payment computed by reference to oil production, but did not, all of those factors should have led the upper tribunal to conclude, and surely respectfully this court to conclude, that 6.2 is designed to catch payments of a nature given to the grantor of the right to work and not payments made to someone who has alienated or transferred the right to work. And if we are right about that, then Sol Petro was not the grantor and at best, RBC stands in the shoes of Sol Petro under clause 5.4 by virtue of the assignment, such that the sums received by the bank are not from a right to a variable payment given as consideration for the right to work. <coughs> And if we were right about that, then the upper tribunal of the first tier were wrong, and you should allow this appeal. My fifth main heading is to contemplate our ground two. So you are, one must assume, not persuaded by my ground one. <coughs> so you're left thinking that six two could or may apply to a right to a payment given for the transfer of the right to work bucket. But even in that world, one has to ask what rights did Sol Petro have? Because RBC can only stand in the shoes to the extent of the rights that Sol Petro Prior to the SPA being entered into, SUKL had the right to work bucket. And it was SUKL that was working bucket, along with the other parties who had an interest in bucket. All that Sol Petro had was a contractual right to the oil one under the illustrative agreement. 
BP then enters into the SPA with Solpetro. SUKL is not a party to that agreement, subject of it. There is no transfer under the SPA of the license to extract the oil from Buchan. That right was held by SUKL and it stays held by SUKL. So Solpetro did not itself work Buchan or hold the right to work Buchan. Under the illustrative agreement, Solpetro had the right to oil one, and that's the right to a movable. Once the oil is out of the ground, landed, it's a movable. And by virtue of the novation of the illustrative agreement by Solpetro to BP, BP become the party to the second illustrative agreement, and BP come to have the right to the oil one. Clause 5.4 then makes provision for payments to Solpetro by reference to the value of the oil extracted and sold. That was, in effect, a mechanic by which BP would share the dealing profits of dealing in the oil being a movable. But those payments are not consideration for the right to work Buchan, because that was not Solpetro's to sell. Despite the very best efforts of my learned friends below, so far successful, to clean aid the commercial reality, or the accurate but irrelevant point, eventually these rights move from the Solpetro group to the BP group, all of which is true. There was no sale under the SPA of the right to work. There was we a transfer of the shares in SUK. A transfer of the shares in SUK, SUK itself holding the right to work. And we say that's a that's a, a debate or a dispute that only really admits of one answer. The payment that's made under the clause 5.4 is simply not for consideration for the right to work. So even if you think against me on ground one, this uh, 6.2 extends both to grant and alienation, there was here no alienation by Solpetro. Well, there was an alienation within Article 13. There was an there alienation was. of shares deriving their value from a movable property. Correct. Uh, well, well, from third not from immovable property, but from 13.4 rights. 13.4 rights. Yes. You said, well, a, you said a license is not itself a movable property. Is that not a right to work? Well, the license held by SUKO is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a right to explore and extract from the seabed. Is that not a right to work within the meaning of Article 6.2? Uh, yes. So is it not immovable property for the purposes of Article 13.5a? What the fifth limb of 6.2 uh, deems, I use deem in the loose oh, language, I, I, to be immovable property is the, is the payment. Is, not, is the right to the payment. It's not the right to work. Not the right to work. So the license itself is not immovable property. Correct. But it. Okay, I'm, well, it just to, oh, sorry, rudely interrupt. If that were not right, 13.5 wouldn't need to refer to a 13.4 right. Yeah. So, had there been any gain from the disposal, Sol Petro's disposal of the shares in the UK company, BP, it could have been taxed under Article 13.5. Yes. Yes. It, it could and under the treaty should have been taxable under 13.5. Well, in 
côté um, the what was sold you're looking at the novation um, under 30s or you'd say that what was sold might be capable of being taxed as a gain 13.4b it's gain from yes. the alienation mm. of any right to asset to, asset to yes. be produced yes. they're looking at some 13. petro it's a 13.4b right oh. you would say that yeah. would have been taxable whatever however it was should have been was or should have been computed at the time Sol Petro should have brought into account um, its sales proceeds. Yes. Yes. Just so the court has it, and I suspect you see it, the reason we lost on this both times, <laughs> the first tier and the upper tribunal say, well, the reality is um, this was really a sale of the right to work. We looked at it in the round. It was sold Petra's oil field, and they sold it to BP. Yes, oil field was here, and it ended up over here. Yeah. Um, and at a high level of generality, that's true. But with respect to the tribunals below, we can't apply these rules at that high level of generality. We've actually got to tax RBC by reference to the contract to which it becomes an inadvertent party. There was a debate below about whether the, the approach that Malone Friend was urging was a, a piercing of the corporate veil and not sure that helps or, or doesn't, but that was in effect the argument, and we say it's, it's flawed for the reasons we set out in our skeleton in paragraph 60 through to 66. I didn't understand it to depend upon a piercing of the corporate veil. I thought there was an argument that under the illustrative agreement, Sol Petro itself had a right to direct how the work should be done, and that was sufficient. That's one of the ways it was put, but the clause that we looked at, it's article Five, I think the tail end provides that Sol Petro must put up its share of the finance. It must offer up the work programs, which will then be implemented. Which will then be implemented, but implemented by Sol Petro UK. Just so the, the, the court has, the reason this is particularly galling for my clients is we lent money to a Canadian company and they still haven't got all our money. We are net down on, on the loan we made. Um, and salt is being rubbed in our wounds by the suggestion that this is taxable on the receipt in Canada and in the UK at the royal tax rate. I reiterate what I made, that, that might be the right answer. So my sixth heading, um, what went wrong below? Now, in a sense, I've covered this ground. Um, but if I just give you the, the highlights, and I'll give you some paragraph references. <coughs> the first tier accepted my learned friend's submissions. That's first tier, paragraph 55. And those submissions uh, begin at paragraph 36 in the first tier. <coughs> The argument, in effect, was, well, concession in the French text could apply to transfer. There's nothing in the English text that limits it to a case of grant. The 6.2 can apply to the transfer of a right, and 6.2 should apply if, in substance, the payments are given for the working of the oil, and that's really what happened here. And that's the first tier from paragraphs 36 through to 61. Um, I've made the point that we had relied on the relationship between 6 and 13, and that was 
cited to the first tier but not addressed. So one needs to look at paragraphs 37, 38, and then 54 to 55. The first tier was also concerned that a decision in the bank's favour would open up a large gap in the UK corporation tax net, whereby oil profits would not be charged in the UK. We had a debate in the first tier hearing as to how that might arise. Our my own friends didn't offer up a concrete example as to how that problem <coughs> might arise. But the first tier sets out in its paragraph 54 what it sees as a loophole in uh, the ring fence if RBC is not taxable. Uh, and for various reasons, we do not accept that example. Um, the FTT's paragraph 54 was not discussed in the hearing. Uh, we say it is a, a bad example because the FTT postulates a granting a license to B at a price equal to cost of works, i.e. an undervalue, for B then to assign to C at market value. The first tier's thesis was that if you did that, would be outside Article 6 to the extent of the real value because that would only attach to the assignment and not to the grant. Sorry, which paragraph was this? Paragraph 54 Thank you. in the first tier. But that example assumes that A and B will deal not at arm's length. And A wouldn't do that with B unless they were related parties, and as soon as they're related parties, we have transfer pricing rules that would prevent that sort of transaction. I can deal with this in reply if my friend wants to revive it, but it, it is a bad example. It just doesn't work. And there is no, uh, the upshot of that is that there is no avoidance opportunity here. But in any event, this is not an avoidance case. And one can't construe the double tax agreement compliant with the UK's international obligations by reference to whatever domestic concerns the commissioners might have in relation to another set of facts. Instead, you've got to give proper effect to the purpose of Article 6 to in this way. Now, we made all of these complaints to the upper tribunal, uh, and we had a very similar debate in the upper tribunal to the one we'd had in the first tier. Uh, and the court would have identified we lost again. Criticisms we make this time of the upper tribunal is that the upper tribunal misunderstood our case on Article 6 and Article 13. That's our skeleton in this appeal, paragraph 41. The upper tribunal mistakenly saw significance in the fact that Article 13 only deals with oil and not other resources. And that's true, but of course, specific provision is made for oil in the treaty oil was no doubt the resource that was particularly relevant to the parties. But we are not a case about coal or gold or tin. What you've got to do is apply these articles to a dispute about oil. So we deal with that in our paragraph 42 in our skeleton here. Um, the upper tribunal saw um, article 13 as somehow being a limitation on article 6. And we say that's not right. It's our skeleton paragraph 43. I mean, just going back to your point about the specific provision for oil in the treaty, of which you pointed to two, Article 13 and 27A, there are effectively provisions for the extension of taxing rights. They are. I accept that. Um, well, that's not necessarily a point against you. A choice has been made, you could say, that uh, oil and gas should be subject specific provisions which go beyond the permissible taxing provisions in relation to other resources. Yes, if, if we didn't have um, 13, 4 and 27a, we would have a rule in 6 that just dealt with all mineral resources and we'd have to work out how to apply 6. But we know that specific provision yes. was made for oil. So on your case, for example, going back to the Article 13.4b, disposals of uh, rights to assets to be produced, if that had been gold, 
that provision wouldn't have applied. It's not hydrocarbons. Um, and, well, you, you, you could take comfort from that. And the, I know the revenues position is that, well, we put those provisions in out, out of an abundance of caution, but... Well, I find the case below, and I think here, is that 13.4, at least B, mm. is only really there just to make clear what is implicit elsewhere and it's confirmatory. But I would say, echoing what's, what's said in, in Anson, that here's a, here's a conclusion that 13.4 B was not necessary. You are being asked to conclude that there's a part of the treaty that the two states agreed that on a careful reading is dissociable. Lord Reed in Anson is clear that that's the result you should be wary of arriving. It is undoubtedly the case that special provision is made for oil. We are an oil case. You've got to apply the whole thing as a coherent whole. Um, in future, there is a separate debate about coal or tin or gold. Well, then, so be it. That will have to be worked out. Um, equally, so the upper tribal were wrong to see that there was a hole in the ring fence, um, and we've addressed that in our skeleton at paragraphs 44 and 45. And we criticised the upper tribunal for their failure to pay proper regard to the other relevant materials that we put before them. Article 12, the other treaties, etc. And that's our paragraph 48. And we criticised the upper tribunal's approach to and conclusions on the French text. That's our skeleton at paragraphs 51 to 55. Now, there's two points that I haven't specifically addressed because they're in my French response notice, but you know, I agreed that I should at least address them and then, if need be, um, you could have the ultimate right to reply if, if that was helpful to the court. But um, you have our answer, I hope, to the bulk of what's in my French skeleton. There's two specific points that are added by way of respondent's notice. Firstly, they say that even if we don't fall, we, the bank, don't fall within 6-2, we fall within Article 6.1 because what we have is income from immovable property. And as we understand the argument, it is that because Buchan is in the UK continental shelf, and the UK continental shelf is part of the UK for the purposes of the treaty, so far so good. And because the UK continental shelf is itself the movable property, uh, therefore the income that is derived from the bank is income from that immovable property. And we say, with respect, that's, that's nonsense. And we've addressed that in our supplementary skeleton, which is in the core bundle tab 15, Paragraphs four to nine. Second argument that's put by my Malone and friends in their respondents notice is that the payments, if they're not in six two, would be gains from the alienation of rights to an interest in or the benefit of the oil, or possibly shares deriving from a value from such rights, so that they would be within 13.4 and 13.5a, such that the UK would then have taxing rights under Article 13, which it would then be entitled to use to charge the bank to tax on income. And that is, in effect, an argument that instead of going through the gateway of Article 6, <coughs> it would go through the, the gateway of Article 13, but then use the opening of that gateway to justify a tax on income. 
we say they're not entitled to do that. That's not how double tax treaties work. And that's in our supplementary skeleton at paragraphs 10 to 15. Um, and that argument, of course, also relies on the proposition that either Sol Petro or, in fact, the bank are the alienator of the title of property that were called by Article 13. And the bank didn't alienate anything. It didn't Sol Petro? Sol Petro did. But this is an argument about the disposal of assets by the person you're trying to tax. Is that right? Sol Petro alienates rights to the oil in return for a stream of payments. If it's right that Article 13 applies, uh, 13 4B entitles the UK to tax that stream of payments as a gain on the alienation of a right to assets to be produced in the UK, and then the bank steps into Sol Petro's shoes and receives those payments. Does it, does it, does it not also entitle the UK to the tax? Because under Article 13, what you have the right to do is to tax the person who alienated it. On the gain they make. If they then assign their rights to somebody else, that's that doesn't, not, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That would be a different category of payment under income or capital. 13 taxes the alienator. Yeah. Well, I think you accepted that for Article 6 purposes the bank steps into Sol Petro's shoes when you're trying to characterise what the payments are. Right? Under Clause 5.4. Yeah. yeah. But you still say that the, even if Sol Petro could be taxed <coughs> as receiving a gain on alienation, can't do the same with the bank. Correct. Yeah. Because the, the bank here didn't sell anything. So that would take me to my last heading, which is if you're against me on the scope of the treaty, the UK has taxed. Has the UK validly exercised those rights? <coughs> and that turns on the scope of uh, section 1313, which is in the first volume of authorities at tab 13. Uh, <coughs> page 279. So 1313.1.279, any profits from exploration or exploitation activities carried on in the UK sector of this continental shelf, or from exploration or exploitation rights, are treated for corporation tax purposes as profits from activities or property in the UK. You've got to be within A or B. What, what does, because all the debate has been on the subsection you're about to come on, two and three, what does subsection one do? It determines that activities of the right nature that are carried on in the UK continental shelf, which give rise to profits, are taxable in the UK, whether or not that otherwise would have been the case. Yes, I mean, the job seems to be largely done by subsection two, but which is what we're struggling with. T two is the obvious candidate where you're dealing with a non-resident company. Yes, and I realise subsection one isn't limited in that way. Um, well, it 
suppose if we start with two, the yeah. problem, if you're the UK Treasury, what problem are you trying to solve? Yeah. You're trying to solve a US oil company with an activity in Buckingham. So you're concerned that you're dealing with a non-resident company, so you ensure that there is a deemed permanent establishment. And that's 1313-2. Thirteen thirteen one makes clear that the profits from the right sort of activity are UK profits, irrespective of the residence of the company conducting them. Then 1313.3 works for both of 1 and 2. So exploration or exploitation activities means activities carried on in connection with the exploration or exploitation of so much of the seabed and subsoil and natural resources as is situated in the UK or the UK sector of the continental shelf. That's your oil exploration activity and extraction. And then exploration or exploitation rights means rights to assets to be produced by exploration or exploitation activities, i.e., again, on the UK sector of the continental shelf, for interest in or for the benefit of such assets. So those definitions <coughs> apply in 1313.2, where you're dealing with non UK residents. And also when you're dealing with UK listed companies, which would be 1313. And what was said against us below in the first tier is that RBC had exploration or exploitation activities in the UK continental shelf. So that was a 13, 13, 2. A argument, and that was rejected in the first tier and in the upper tribunal. The argument that's now successful so far and maintained by Melinda Brennan is that we're a 1313 2B case. Because while the bank doesn't have a right to the assets to be produced by exploitation at Buckham, and it doesn't have interests in the oil produced at Buckham, has the benefit of the oil produced at Buckham. <coughs> That would have the effect of giving the bank, in effect, a ring fence trade, because it would have a, an oil extraction activity as defined, so it would be inside the ring fence. But the argument against me that was accepted by the upper tribunal at paragraphs 193 to 199 is that we we, the bank, have the benefit of the oil. Now, we say one needs to read this as a whole, but 1313.2a is aimed at the profit made by the oil company, the venturer in the North Sea, from the exploration and the exploitation itself. 1313.2b is clearly aimed at something else, a person who derives a profit from the right to the oil once extracted, provided that there is a sufficient nexus to the activity in the North Sea, that sufficient nexus being measured in one of three ways. And the 
first way that it's put is to say it extends to someone who has the right to the oil. Well, RBC doesn't have the right to the oil. That's held by BP under the Lisbon Agreement. It extends, secondly, to someone who has an interest in the oil. And RBC doesn't have an interest in only remaining category is whether RBC has the benefit of the oil. We say no, but the statute requires that you must have the benefit of the oil, the movable itself. And here, under the illustration agreement, the oil is extracted, delivered to the UK, sold on the open market, at a time of BP's choosing, at the value they get on the open market, and they then compute a sum each quarter that is due to RBC, that is computed by reference to the value of the oil sold. but it is not itself the benefit of the oil. The statutory language is not a benefit from, or related to, or calculated by reference to. It has to be a benefit of the oil. You rely on the of as opposed to from. Yes. You also rely on the definite article. Yes. The. So what, what do you say that does? Because one end of the spectrum, it might suggest that it only applies where the whole benefit, so that means of the oil, is provided in distinction where interest's in, and everyone understands that that could be something as much as an interest. So what do you say, what, what do you say the, the use of the definite article? making clear that it has to be the benefit of the oil that is extracted, that is the subject of the exploration and exploitation activity. But let's assume there were a, a thousand barrels extracted. And I came to this court and said, well, we've only got a right to a sum of money computed by reference to 990 of them. That doesn't amount to the benefit of the oil would rightly say, well, no, you have to read that statute as extending to the oil that is the subject matter of your competition. So the doesn't carry the flavor of all of the oil, but it does carry the sense of it is the benefit of the oil that has been extracted pursuant to these exploration and exploitation activities. And so it's just uh, light of, in fact, it it, um, it enhances or uh, your argument in relation to or yes yes it does it does that but it could be a part of I, I accept yes in, in my a thousand and nine hundred and ninety nine yes. I, I I don't maintain that I would win the, the courses now of course here acutely. When the oil price is less than 20, the bank gets nothing. And we're only entitled to half of the difference between sale price and 20, computed each quarter. And test this for a moment. What's our remedy if BP hadn't paid? We have no claim on any oil. We have a contractual right against BP shows in action that we could pursue by means of a claim for damages. We have no interest in, right over, or claim on the oil itself. Yes, but that argument, I mean, the revenue says in response to that, well, that's the, that's what the 
conflict of interest is dealing with. So, so how do you respond to that? Because otherwise, it, you know, you're sort of, the argument is that you're giving benefit. It's still effectively a similar meaning. It, it has to have a similar meaning, but I accept it. It clearly means something other than a right over or an interest in. But in our cases, it has to be some kind of claim over the oil itself, not merely a contractual right to an amount computed by reference to an oil price. Suppose there were a contract under which BP retained ownership of the oil. On the sale of the oil, you'd have to pass the entirety of the net proceeds to you. Would, that, would you have to benefit of the oil? <coughs> My answer would be no. <coughs> I have a contractual right to an amount computed by reference to sale price less expenses. And to hark back to the treaty language we've seen and the language we've seen in the Canadian statutes, it doesn't say amount computed by reference. No, no, I understand that. do say that there is an important conceptual difference in the tax world, as I suspect elsewhere, between a sum of money that has a particular character, such as rent or dividends or interest, and an amount that's computed by reference to a metric. And the amount that's computed by reference to a metric does not necessarily share the character of the metric by which it is I understand that as well, but going back to my lady's question, if it's some sort of right to the oil, over the oil, I think was what you said. A claim, it has to be some kind of claim over the oil. Some sort of claim over the oil. How do you distinguish that from an interest in the oil? What the drafter is, is trying to encompass <laughs> is quite clearly a contractual right to the oil itself. That's the person who's on the Solpetro end of the illustrative agreement. That's a right to an asset. It's a right to, to an asset, the oil. Um, yes, just pausing there might, and looking at the illustrative agreement, might you say that Solpetro is entitled to the benefit of? Not necessarily. I mean, the, the, it was a contractual right. It's been described as contractual. Right, not necessarily a property interest in the oil as it comes out of the ground. Well, th there is an oddity. Um, we just, just ought to turn up the illustrative agreement in yeah. itself. Um, tab one of the supplementary bundle. Page seven, article six. It says, shall own and receive. Mm. Now, for my part, I've always understood the nature of the right held by Signal or Solpetro was a contractual right to the oil. But the example illustrative agreement we have, so far as we know it's representative, talks in terms of ownership. Okay. If it's just a contractual right, it covers somebody like Sol Petro. If it's if effect is to be given to own and receive, then you've got some kind of interest in or the benefit of. Yes, but if it, we hadn't had that those words in Article Six and it was a pure contractual right, you might you might say Sol Petro had the benefit of the oil. I would. You know. But what we do know, because the language that we can see elsewhere in Canada and in some treaties, it's perfectly possible um, to extend this notion to amounts computed by reference. And that statutory language has not been in Section 1313 since it came in in 1923. 
Those were the other treaties you showed us. The yes, the the other the other treaties and um, in the Canadian Incon Tax Convention interpretation. Yes. Now, one can't construe our statutes by reference to those materials. I'm not saying that we have to do that. But we have to give some meaning to some give some meaning to the benefit of the oil, where we know it is wider or broader than the notion of a right over or an interest in. So I have to accept the benefit is wider. I say it is some kind of claim, but the relevant words are not so much benefit, because that's a chameleon term that doesn't necessarily help. Keywords are of and the. And if, as the bank has, all you hold is a contractual right to an amount computed in a certain way, you don't have a right to or an interest in or the benefit of. One of the points made against us is that, well, in a broad commercial sense, RBC's profits are driven by the price of the oil that was sold. And so really, meaningfully, it gets the commercial benefit of, of the oil being sold. And at a high level of abstraction, that's true. But we say that's not enough. One's got to give effect to 13.13.3. where the language is not computed by reference to or commercial benefit. So it's a short point. We say some kind of claim over the oil itself. We don't have that. We don't have equivalent language of computed by reference to. Had the UK wanted to extend uh, the boundary of the ring fence to that extent, it would have said so. But harking back to a point I made in opening this morning, this is where there are a lot of other people interested in the outcome of this case, because there are a lot of finance agreements by which projects in the North Sea are financed on the basis either of interest or principal, or some other kind of return to the lender, or finance provider, being computed by reference to the value of what comes out. The errors that were made by the upper tribunal in this regard, um, in effect, I've, I've covered. They're set out in our skeleton argument, tab 14 of the core bundle, paragraphs 67 to 73. And in particular, the upper tribunal were wrong in their analysis, which runs from 193 um, through to 199, to conclude that because the value of what RBC received was driven by the price at which oil was sold, that was somehow enough. And the way the upper tribunal put it is to say there's a sufficiently direct and obvious link. And we say there is no obvious and direct link, certainly not one as would meet. So if you're against us on Article 6, so the UK has taxing rights, we say the exercise of those rights um, does not encompass the payments received by the bank, uh, and we would be entitled to get home on the scope of 13.13. Now, unless I can help the court further, those are my submissions in, in opening. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Peacock. Um, we're very grateful to you. Um, over to Mr. Brown. Hi, lady. I'm obliged. What I propose to do is to take the skeleton argument as read and follow broadly the same order as my learned friends, so dealing in turn with the issues relating to the treaty, first of all, before turning to the 
UK domestic law issues, there is a, a, a rider that I make on that by way of a preliminary point but before I do go and perform that exercise of looking at the treaty first and then the UK law, which is that while that running order may be convenient because it's the way that my friend has presented the, the order of his arguments throughout and in consequence it's the way that both of the tribunals below have dealt with those issues, that running order actually in my submission is logically not quite right. That's the point that we make uh, in our skeleton at paragraph 9. And I do say, and this is the preliminary point, that the starting point as a matter of principle for this analysis uh, should actually be the UK taxing provisions. And that point is noted by the upper tribunal in paragraph 10 of its decision. That's for at least two reasons. And the second of these may actually matter for this court's consideration of, of the issues on, on this appeal. Um, the, the first is a more conceptual, perhaps academic point, to say the question whether the treaty precludes the UK from taxing the payments, it arises only if the UK has actually sought to tax the payments. I say that may be seen as being academic in the sense that, well, what do you take first? It might just be... Um, matter of convenience, which, which you take first. Where it might actually matter is, is the second point, which is that as regards the application of the treaty by a contracting state, we know, and we saw this in Article 3 sub 2, which we looked at briefly with Manana Friend in his opening submission, we know that any term that's not otherwise defined, that has the meaning which it has under the laws of the contracting state relating to the taxes uh, which are the subject of the treaty. And that, in, in my submission, is, is actually the reason why it, it may matter. And that actually um, is, is the key to the answer to, to some of the points, and I'll come on to the detail of this when, when, when I get there, uh, when we were discussing, is it income, is it capital, what are we, what are we looking at? That actually um, what we're interested in um, at least by way of starting point, when it comes to terms that are not defined in the treaty, is the classification under national law. Now, that conclusion, uh, in my submission, is um, supported by, in, in, indeed um, compelled by, the observations of Lord Justice Singh uh, in this court in the Irish Bank Resolution Corporation case. It's a case that was mentioned um, this morning, but we didn't and turn it up. I should just show you the, the passages. It's a concurring speech by Lord Justice Singh with which um, Lady Justice Rose and um, herself agrees. Um, Lord Justice Patton, who gave the lead judgment, doesn't uh, refer to it. Sorry, which volume? So, sorry, it's Authorities, Volume 3, Tab 25. Volume 2. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, Volume 2. Volume two. Yes, the cases are all in volume two and the other materials in volume three. I hope I don't do that again because I'm working electronically. I'm trying to. Um, so, tab 25, the report starts at page 571, which I, I think we only uh, opened. The leading judgment is from Lord Justice Patton, who doesn't deal with this particular point. The, the passages I'm interested in are those from Lord Justice Singh, which are at electronic page 598, page 1973 in the report. Um, and really, it, it is 54 and following in, in his judgment. You can see the agreement of Lady Justice Rose at paragraph 61, uh, and it's a short... Um, Does Lord Justice Patton comment? I, 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 sorry, I, I hope I said my lady. Lord Justice Patton doesn't say anything. Right, thank you. But, it, but it's two, two members of this yes. court um, make, making these points. And it follows really in, in summary, you'll see from the fact that the treaty isn't directly applicable in the United Kingdom. And you can see in 54, Lord Justice Singh, just above the letter C, he, he was concerned that there was some confusion. Um, and I hope I wasn't in part responsible for it. I was in this case, I should, I should say. Um, because insufficient attention had been paid to it, an important <coughs> distinction between different parts of the state. And what we were talking about, as you can see at the start of paragraph 55, was the ability of the UK Parliament to enact a particular statutory measure. So this was um, a particular manner of calculating 
um, capital for the purposes of, of calculating um, bank profits. So there was primary legislation, which in the Irish bank case was agreed that would have produced a UK tax change. And the taxpayers' arguments stood or fell um, simply uh, on the treaty. And what Lord Justice Singh is picking up here is some reliance that the taxpayers were placing on HMRC administrative practice. And you can see in 55, he regards that as irrelevant. He notes at letter E that actually here, HMRC was acting to give effect to primary legislation, and he refers to the particular legislation with which he was concerned. And then he identifies the question um, beside the letter F. What, what in truth is the will of Parliament where a provision in primary legislation is said to conflict with the double taxation convention? And the answer to that question, for the years with which Lord Justice Singh was concerned, was in 788 sub 3 of the 1988 Act. Of course, we're now on to sections 2 and 6 of the 2010 Act. Um, but they are to materially similar effect. And then paragraph 56, the court will see the, the ordinary constitutional provision summarised that the court is bound to give effect to the primary legislation. And beside little g, that would be so whatever might be said in the international treaty. And nor could it make any difference that the treaty is incorporated into domestic law by an order. And 57... Uh, deals with the position if even if you just look at then 788 sub 3 on its own, now sections 2 and 6 of the 2010 Act. And as Lord Justice Singh notes, that's because of the doctrine of implied repeal. But then he says it's clear, just above J, in the context of double taxation treaties, the doctrine of implied repeal doesn't operate. And he compares the position um, to the position at least pre exit in relation to. EU law. Um, so that, that really is the running order um, conceptually. He goes on to make further points about um, how, as a matter of international law, one looks at 58, the state's one undivided entity. <coughs> as it happens, that, that's why, among other reasons, I have no difficulty in this court looking at the French version of the treaty. Um, as a matter of the Vienna Convention, no difficulty with that at all. The debate on the French is what, what does one actually take from the French? <clears throat> and again, he returns to the question of subsequent state practice um, and noting that the unilateral practice of one party it can't alter the meaning um, of a treaty and emphasising in 60 the need to find a basis for the material um, that, that was being prayed in aid um, to be taken into account um, as an interpretative aid, finding it either in treaty law or in customary international law. And just while I'm on Irish banks, it'll save me going back to this. Uh, Lord Justice Patton, he also de does deal uh, with Point which is of, of relevance to what I'll say later, which is at his paragraph 22, where he approves, this is on electronic page 582, he approves three paragraphs in the upper tribunal decision, particularly looking at, at subsequent conduct of parties to a treaty. And the 29 to 31 sets out an approach. Sorry, you have to read that. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. 22. It's electronic 582. So this is tw this is 22 in um, Lord Justice Patton's judgment. And he sets out, it's 29 <coughs> to 31 in the upper yeah. tribunal, which he says at 23, this seems to me to be clearly right. This was looking in particular at an alleged unilateral practice on the part of the revenue as how it had dealt with capital attribution. The point the upper tribunal was making uh, was that, you see this halfway through the upper tribunal's paragraph 30, that such agreement of practice would have to be evidenced and critically and would have to demonstrate 
a bilateral agreement or practice involving both parties to the treaty, and that the unilateral fact of the contracting party that that didn't affect the meaning of the treaty or constitute material going to its construction. That's what's approved um, at 23, and that's reiterated by Lord Justice Patton just beside the letter F, um, so that there was no identification of any established principle of international law which recognises the unilateral practice of a contracting state as an aid to the construction of a treaty. And I just mention that now because that is a point that I'll need to return to when we come to look at a number of the items of material that have been put before this court um, on, in support of this appeal. So as I say, for, for convenience, I don't have any difficulty in following Milan Friends' course and, and dealing with the treaty first uh, and indeed dealing with the grounds of appeal in turn, which is exactly what I, what I will do. Um, I do simply say that what one is doing, as Lord Justice Singh observed, is one is ultimately looking to identify the will of Parliament. And the question is, are, are there taxing rights? Has the UK, in fact, restricted its taxing rights through this um, particular treaty? That's the first preliminary point. The second preliminary point, which is one that I suspect we'll come back to on a, a number of occasions, probably tomorrow morning, is, is on the facts. On a number of occasions, Milana Friend has characterized the illustrative agreement as giving simply a right to the oil one. That's been said uh, on a number of occasions today. Now, that is not a complete statement of what the illustrative agreement did. It is important um, to bear in mind that, yes, that is one of the things that Sulpetro got. Um, but you can see, and we, we looked at this in Article 5, uh, which is in the supplementary bundle, tab 1, at page 7, that having agreed to put up funding for all expenses, including, um, I just asked the court to note, in lines four to five, including the payment of the royalty and other payments called for by the regulations. So the parent agrees actually to put the subsidiary in funds to pay the royalty that's due to the crown. Having done that, it's the parent that's going to provide, and this is in the final sentence of Article 5, the budget and the work programmes. And, and this I do say is critical when one's looking particularly at Milan Friends Ground 2, and such programmes shall be carried out. So it's the parent, in this case Solpetro, which has the right to direct the work that shall be done in the Buchan field. And as Milan Friend, I think, accepted in exchanges with my Lord Lord Justice Nucci at around 10 to 12 this morning, when you look at this case, SUKL actually has nothing of any real value. It's true that it's the repository of the license in the sense that it holds the piece of paper. But actually, the right to direct the work programs and the entitlement to the oil that's won, uh, they lie with the parent company. And that is of critical significance, particularly when we look at the Man of Friends Grand 2. So, if I can turn now, please, to the treaty, as the court will be well aware, there are two, two points that are taken. I'll deal with them in turn. The first is the argument that Article 6.2 requires the right to the payment to be given to the grantor of the right to work the mineral deposits. And if I may, I'll, I'll reflect overnight, because there did seem to be some, some little evolutions in, in the argument in the oral submissions. And I may just need to address some of the nuances on this tomorrow, because there the, were at least hints that Lenefram was moving away from a, what we might call a, a pure grant case and looking to draw analogies with um, um, rental income or 
continuing ownership or circumstances like, like that. Nothing may turn on it, but it may be necessary to reflect on that a little bit further. What I say is that that argument, uh, which is the, the thrust of ground one of the appeal, it relies essentially on reading words in to Article 6.2. You won't see any such limitation on the face of Article 6.2 itself. So that's why Learn a Friend has been forced to say, well, you have to read the treaty as a whole. Um, you have to look at other articles. You have to look at other types of language. You have to look even at different instruments. All of that's been said this morning uh, and into this afternoon. But my submission is that none of the material that's relied upon justifies um, the restrictive reading of Article 6.2. In summary, and these are points we make in the skeleton, paragraphs 25 to 27, the court will not find any such limitation in the text of Article 6.2. <clears throat> That's so, and I'll make this good, whether we look at the English version or the French version. Secondly, if we think about the matter in, in terms of principle, <clears throat> it does not make sense to attribute such a limited purpose or scope to Article 6.2. In my submission, it would be unprincipled, and both the first tier and the upper tribunal were right to recognize this. It would be unprincipled to give taxing rights to the source state only in cases involving a grantor. That's so particularly when one has regard to the commentary on Article 6, which emphasizes the close economic link between the source state and immovable property. And that close economic link in my submission is present just as much in the case of a transferor uh, as it does in the case of an original grant. And thirdly, and the upper tribunal in my submission was entirely correct to take these sorts of factors into account, RBC's approach in this appeal, it would lead to odd and to surprising outcomes. And two in particular are that the UK would, would have limited, essentially by a side with, um, taxing rights in respect of income, because it would suddenly find in the case of a transfer that it would not be able to tax income arising from the transfer. You would have a radical difference in treatment, and I think the Lairfram must accept um, wasn't addressed expressly this morning, but you would have a radical difference in treatment between, for example, a sub-license on the one hand uh, and an assignment on the other, which it is very difficult to think would have been contemplated by the contracting states. And you also have a real oddity, particularly in the case of oil taxation and the continental shelf, that, of course, in the UK, uh, the person who is the grand tour of rights in respect of oil exploration is the Crown. So the UK would have agreed with Canada essentially a self-defeating um, provision um, in Article 6, Sub 2. Yes, but Article 6, Sub 2 follows the OECD model. It's not a provision directed at oil rights. That's true. That's true. Um, but it is odd. If, if that is um, the outcome, and I, I'm not in a position that able to help with what the position in, in France or Germany or whatever is as to a state's rights <coughs> to um, oil resources, um, but I do simply make the point that we, that we are we're looking at a bilateral treaty between the UK and Canada, and that point which did resonate, I say rightly, with, with the upper tribunal about the is, in my submission, a matter that it's legitimate um, to have regard to in testing the outcome um, of the construction uh, for which Melania Friend is, is, is arguing. There's also a point that Article 6 to isn't confined to hydrocarbons. That's right. It applies to all minerals. So if, I, if I've got a quarry on my land and grant a Canadian company the right to quarry yeah. it, it's got nothing to do with the Crown. Uh, that's plainly uh, within Absolutely right, and 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 that doesn't that doesn't give me any problem. I, I'm simply observing that 
um, Larry Fram made quite a bit of this and um, I don't really mind whether it was evidence or not that was being given this morning, it really doesn't matter, but in terms of the importance and the development of practice in relation to North Sea oil, purely for the UK, um, I'm perfectly content with the point that was being made that this was a very important result. When we're looking at a bilateral treaty, I'm simply making the point that it's surprising, if nothing else, if the result would be that the only uh, recipient of income that would be within the scope of Article 6.2 would be the Crown. That is a surprising conclusion, but it's the consequence, if we're looking at North Sea oil, um, of the analysis that's being urged upon this court from Milan and Friend. I absolutely take my Lord Logistics Nugent's point that in an onshore case of, say, a coal mine, um, we may not be dealing with the Crown as grantee, um, but, but one's entitled to, to look at the outcome in, in this particular case when it comes to testing the validity of the uh, construction um, yep. of the legislation. So there are a number of matters um, that have been relied on uh, by my learned friend. I just want to make sure that I've, I've dealt with all of them because some, some have had slightly more emphasis um, than others orally, but I'll stick, if I may, to the running order that he had in his skeleton, um, where there were really five topics there, and I'll sweep up the points orally as, as I go along and deal with these in turn. Um, first is the overall purpose of Article 6. Second is the terms of other double taxation agreements. The third is the commentary to Article 12 in the OECD model. The fourth is Article 13, and the fifth is the French text. So if I may, I'll just take that as the framework, and I'll, and I'll drop in other, other points um, as I need to. On the overall purpose, it, it's an important preliminary step from a learned friend to say, and he does this in paragraph 31 of his skeleton, to say that the overall purpose of Article 6 is to tax rental type income. That foreshadows actually quite a lot of the, the points of more granular detail um, that come later. But that assertion in paragraph 31 of the RBC skeleton about overall purpose is not right. It's no doubt true that Article 6 is capable of, and indeed does apply to, rental type income, but Article 6 is not so limited. Let's give a, a couple of examples. We know that income from agriculture or forestry, that's included. It's in Article 6 1 itself. That's the, the activity um, of, of agriculture and of forestry. Milano Friend um, himself um, accepted. Uh, both in his skeleton, paragraph 30, that income from the direct working on the land by the owner, that that would be within Article 6. Um, that was also repeated orally at about 10 to 12. We also know that consideration for working natural resources, that's covered in Article 6.2. And we know from Article 6.3 that income from immovable property includes profits from alienation of immovable property. And my own friends tried to put Article 6.3 in a very small box and say, ah, oh, well, that's all to do um, with a dealer in immovable property. What we'll see is that actually one can't confine Article 6.3 uh, in the way that my own friend up front seeks um, to do. But I say that it's wrong um, to start from some premise that the overall purpose of Article 6 is tax rental type income. One certainly doesn't have any material that would justify um, that starting point. Um, what Article 6 is doing is allocating taxing rates in respect of immovable property um, to the source state. And the rationale um, for doing that is set out in the OECD commentary. We, we were using this morning the commentary from 2005, because that's the one that, that precedes um, the years of assessment with which we're concerned. And for the most part, if one uses the 2017 commentary, 
it's materially dissimilar in terms of you don't have the sort of issue that came up in, in Irish banks about later commentaries and clarification or, or, or change. But I'm, I'm very happy just to use 2005. I think the points um, that need to be made um, can be seen um, in it. Um, we touched on this, but I don't think actually looked at it. So if, if the court wouldn't mind please panning up um, the 2005 commentary, which will be in volume three at tab 29 in the authorities. The tab starts at electronic page 745 and it sets out the convention itself. The commentary um, starts on article 6 at page 786. see in paragraph one at the second sentence that the reason um, why the taxing rights are allocated to the, to the source state this is due to the fact that there is always a very close economic connection between the source of this income <coughs> and the state of source. And it's also relevant if we're looking um, at the structure of Article 6 to see what is said in paragraph 2. Um, this is probably obvious from reading Article 6 2 in any event, but what it's doing um, is specifically mentioning, again, one sees this in the second sentence, the assets and rights which must always be regarded as immovable property. The draftsman makes the point that, in fact, such assets and rights are already treated as immovable property according to the laws of the taxation of most OECD member countries. That's a point that we may need to come back to when we get to the revenues um, first respondents' notice point, because there, and just to clear up a, a point from this morning, my now friend wants to say oh, it's Article 6 and 1 only. Nothing really turns on this, but what I'm relying on there, of course, is the, the general definition of immovable property without needing um, to go to what's called the fifth limb, so the, the rights to um, variable or fixed payments of consideration for working or the right to work um, mineral reserves. The first respondent's notice point relies on the more general uh, understanding um, of immovable property. And then just while we're on the, the remainder of the, this commentary, it's one of the shortest commentaries in the, um, in the from the OECD. One looks at the other articles. Article seven, for example, has grown, grown like topsy over the years. Article six has not. Um, but you can see, for, for, for example, paragraph three, the purpose of that, uh, indicating that the general rule applies irrespective of the form of exploitation of the immovable um, property. And final point, um, and this uh, has actually greater resonance in relation to Article 13, um, where this is part of the revenues second uh, respondent's notice point, but it's the last sentence um, of um, paragraph 4, that the provisions of the article, they don't prejudge the application of domestic law as regards the manner in which income from immovable property is to be taxed. And we'll see when we get to this in relation to Article 13 that actually there's similar provision in the commentary on Article 13. And this ties in really to the point I made up, up front by way of preliminary that one has to be very careful about backing oneself into a corner or putting oneself into a straitjacket by saying that because we're within a particular article of the treaty, that that somehow tells you something about the way in which 
at the income or the gains, as the case may be, that the way in which they have to be taxed in domestic law. Um, the, the burden of showing you that final sentence in paragraph 4 of the commentary in Article 6, and as we'll see, there's similar provision in the commentary in Article 13, is that actually there's, there's no such um, straight jeopardy. And it ties into, um, I was looking to make good by reference to Lord Justice Singh's judgment in Irish Bank. Um, we have these two separate questions. What, what has the contracting state sought to tax? And then looking at it from an English perspective, is there something in the treaty um, that prevents the application of, of that um, tax change? Can we go back to your first point in the commentary? Yeah. This one, paragraph one. Yeah. Which gives the rationale you emphasise about the close economic connection between the source of the income and the state source. When we're looking at income of the nature we have here, derived by an entity that never had an interest in the inaccurate removable property. How, how strong is that point? In, in my respectful submission, my lady, Framing the question in, in that way um, would be to adopt the wrong perspective because my learned friend understandably, and he's done this before the first tier and before the upper tribunal and he's done it again before, before this court, says we are a Canadian bank. We lent, we lent money, the debt went back, well, went back and, we now, and we now got Yes, but even, even the, Sol Petro. Well, so, that, so that's, the, that's the first point, is, is that one, one should be looking um, in terms of what Solpetro gave away. Okay, but when, when Solpetro, let's assume Solpetro had continued to receive the payments, it no longer had any right, um, even on the, on the wider view, rights in relation to the Buckham field. But what is the state of source? Because normally, in taxation principles, you have income from a source for so long as you have the source. Well, what, what, what has been done um, in Article um, 6.2, lady, is that they, they are treating um, as immovable property the rights to the payment. So the, the, I believe the, yes, we're slightly going round in a circle. But, but, but it, the, your ladyship is, is right that, of course, after having entered into the SPA, it is right that Sulpetro has divested itself of its own interest in the Buckham field. That's right. What it has replaced that with is a right to the payment. And the revenue's position is that those payments, they still represent the value derived from the Buckham field. And we know, looking at, at Article 6.2, that one of the things that is identified as immovable property um, is rights of, of that nature. So it doesn't, in my submission, give me any difficulty in terms of the, the, the closeness of the connection. Because what one has to remember is that what, this, what those payments represent is a continuation of turning, if I can put it in very, in very general terms, of turning those rights in the seabed under the continental shelf um, to account. And that, and that is more than close enough. This is all part of recognizing that immovable property that can be turned to account in a variety of ways. And it's not an answer in, in my submission to say, well, um, the person in question um, no longer has a right, for example, to, um, um, to explore for and exploit oil in the, in, in the North Sea, that that somehow turns off Article 6. Because the draftsmen in Article 6.2, what they wanted to do was to put beyond any doubt that we are still dealing with <coughs> immovable property 
uh, when we're dealing with rights to payments of the type that are specified. Um, j just in parentheses, um, while I'm on this point, my learned friend um, emphasized this morning, he said, well, it, and he drew a distinction between saying, well, it's, it's working, which was in the sense of production, or it's right to work, which would be a transaction for a period of time, because the court will recall that the matter being put in in that sort of a way. The assumption, uh, what I'm about to say may well not matter to this case, um, but just, just so we're entirely accurate about this, the assumption seems to be that any right would have to be of a contractual nature. Um, that isn't right. One, one could hypothesize um, cases where, um, for example, um, there is a trespass or there is some breach of duty that leads to a payment having to be made. There is a right to have a payment, for example, by way of compensation, uh, which might fall within Article 6, but it doesn't matter for our purposes because we're dealing with a, with a right that is a contractual right, but I simply note that that assumption that it, that it has to be contractual um, is certainly not made out on the, on the language. Um, I do dimly recall that I haven't had to read it for many years, um, an American restitution case about, I think it's the Great Onyx Cave, where, um, where mm -hmm. re restitutionary rights are generated where somebody um, tunneled under somebody else's land and that sort of thing might generate a right that's not contractual but which nonetheless involves working a natural resource. I don't think anything turns on that for these purposes. I simply note that the assumption that it has to be contractual um, is um, not well founded. The point that I do make, which, which is germane to this case, is that if one's looking at the matter from the perspective of a very close economic connection, to use the language in the commentary to Article 6, there is in my submission no material difference between a circumstance where the right to work is given by an initial grant on the one hand, um, or by a subsequent transfer um, on the other. Now, the second um, group of sources is to look at the wording in other tax treaties. And this was Maloney Friends Skeleton, paragraph 32. And it was picked up again orally earlier today. Now, I say two things on this. First of all, I say that this approach of looking at the formulations that have been used in other instruments is misconceived as a matter of principle. It's misconceived because it isn't right to seek to interpret a bilateral treaty between the UK and Canada by reference to the drafting of other instruments between different parties and often entered into after the UK-Canada treaty. Now, true it is that we're dealing with um, the UK in one of them, and we're dealing with Canada in another of them, but neither instrument shows any sort of bilateral agreement between the UK and Canada as to how the UK-Canada treaty should be interpreted, which was the burden of the point um, that I was showing you uh, I think it's paragraph 22 and 23 in Lord Justice Patton in Irish Bank. I had the impression that um, uh, Mr. Peter Walker accepted that, but he was saying, look at the kind of words that you could use, and they didn't use. That's all. Yes, and I simply say that doesn't take you anywhere, because you have to look at the words that they did use. Did use, yeah. It may be the case that if a formulation like computed by reference to um, had been used in this treaty, we would not be having a third round of litigation before this court. But that does not show that <coughs> Mr. Peacock is right in saying, and this is the proposition that he needs, the friend needs to persuade this court that Article 6.2 applies only in the case of a grant. And he doesn't get there in my submission by saying, ah, oh, well, there are other formulations that might have done the job um, more neatly. Um, but it is common to, when trying to work out what a piece of drafting means, to think about what could have been said. Well, it's one way of doing it, lady, but we're so often told that um, the, the point, well, if they intend, if they, I being Parliament or here being the contracting mm. party, if they meant that, then they would have said so. Um, 
there are countless examples of, of this being told well, in cases. That there's, argument, that, that there's very little weight. It's said against you. There's one in this treaty, in this very treaty, in Article Thirteen. I've, That's I've, a I've different. Got, I've, got, I've got quite a lot to say about Article yes, Thirteen sure because um, be, because I do say the characterisation of the relationship between the articles um, is is in error. I'm not to get to that until until tomorrow. Um, but I think that, um, as far as I'm concerned at least, um, at the way I understood what, what Mr. Peacock was doing was exactly what, as it's just been explained, that he's saying um, there, are, uh, there are other formulations, uh, some of them uh, are obviously they're between different parties and they uh, post-date this, but it throws some light on the use of the words as they were, and I didn't see him as saying anything more than that. And what, what, and what I'm quibbling with is the last part of that yeah. proposition, that it, that it throws some light. Exactly. I'm, I'm saying when, when one actually looks at this, and, and I'll show the court, um, I'll show you the court the materials themselves, my submission is that those alternative formulations, they do not shed light on the meaning of the words in this treaty precisely because the context is different. I'm just looking at the time. I think I'm not sure if the, if the court is planning on sitting to talk to Porter Keen or... or, or I, I think this is a convenient moment, as long as it is for you also. It is. I, I was just about to embark on the UK-US treaty itself and then to show you um, UK-Canada. So certainly for me, it's a convenient um, moment. That's fine. So, uh, and um, you, you are on track in the sense of you've made the, the most of your so the, little part of time this afternoon. So the timetable um, that my own friend and I agreed envisages that I would hand back to him not later than quarter to four tomorrow. So that yes, but, half an hour for, but, but, but you're hour. happy with the use you've made of oh, the time absolutely. you've had today. Absolutely. I'm just uh, trying to work out whether um, it's necessary to sit a little earlier tomorrow not, to get your work done. Not, so not, not on my account, my lady. Thank I'm you. I'm very happy. With that. That's fine. Well, on that basis then, we'll uh, reconvene at 10.30 tomorrow. Thank you very much indeed. I'm obliged.